And so Michael Cremo has an incredible amount of information to reveal on that. He is a wonderful man, a truly advanced spiritual soul, and is a gift to humanity. And it's our honor to introduce Michael Cremo. A round of applause, please. So welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So in, in the talk I gave before the break, I presented archaeological evidence that contradicts the current theories of human origins. So after people read my book, Forbidden Archaeology, they asked me a question. Well. Now, if you've got all this evidence that contradicts the current theories of human origins, then how do you think we came into existence? What is the real origin of the human species? So I presented an answer to that question in this book, human devolution, a Vedic alternative to Darwin's theory. Now I call it a Vedic alternative because my thoughts on this question are largely inspired by my studies in the ancient Sanskrit writings of India, which are collectively called the Vedas. Veda is a Sanskrit word, it means knowledge. So there are different types of knowledge contained in these ancient Sanskrit writings, and some of the knowledge has to do with who we are and where we came from, and where we should be going. Now, although I'm presenting in my book, Human Devolution, a Vedic alternative, I realize that Vedic alternative is part of a larger family of spiritual alternatives to the current theories of human origins with roots in many of the world's great spiritual traditions. So I'm not claiming to have a monopoly on truth. I think truth can be found in a lot of different places, in a lot of different wisdom traditions, which I also honor and respect. So getting back to this question, uh, where did human beings come from? I propose that before we even ask that question, we should first of all ask the question, what is a human being? You know, we should understand what it is we're trying to explain. Otherwise, how can we know if we properly explained it or not if we don't even know what it is? So today, many scientists will say that a human being or any other living thing is just a very complex machine made out of molecules. In other words, we're simply complex organizations of matter. That's all there is to it. Uh, for example, a prominent uh, British evolutionist, Richard Dawkins, says, we are survival machines, robot vehicles, blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes. It's a very prominent idea in the scientific world today. And as far as our consciousness and mind is concerned, Many scientists will say, well, it's all just a material phenomenon, really. If you organize the molecules in the brain in a sufficiently complex way, it will generate what we call mind and consciousness, but only temporarily and only in association with the brain. At the time of death, when the molecules in the brain are disorganized, there's no more consciousness, no more love, none of that. So this is a matter-based understanding of who we are as conscious beings. They would say it's matter that is primary. Matter, if you organize it in a sufficiently complex way, will temporarily generate what we call consciousness, but only in association with matter, only in association with the brain. But I take a different position. I think if we look at all the evidence, we'll see 
it's more reasonable to say that a human being is made of matter, mind, and consciousness. And when I speak of mind and consciousness, I don't mean temporary byproducts of bioelectrical activity in the brain. I mean real things with their own independent existence. And I know many of you are already convinced of this, but I'm going to reflect back on something that James said yesterday, that in this modern age, it's becoming necessary to be able to justify these things in terms of scientific evidence. So that's pretty much what I'm going to be trying to do in this talk as we proceed through it. So a human being is made of matter, mind, and consciousness. We're not just machines made of matter. We also have to take into account mind and consciousness. Now some scientists, when they hear me say that, they say, look, that's not how we do science in the modern world. Uh, we try to explain everything in terms of what we know. And what we know is matter. And therefore, we should try to explain everything in terms of combinations of matter operating according to known physical and chemical laws. That's what science is. We don't just start introducing all kinds of mystical things like mind and consciousness and, you know, as independent entities. That's mythology. That's something else. Whatever you want to call it, it's not science. Uh, we don't start introducing all kinds of strange new substances into our scientific picture of reality. But actually that's not true, even of modern science. In the last few decades, scientists have been introducing new strange substances into our picture of physical reality. For example, until the 1970s, when astronomers looked out at the cosmos, they tried to explain everything they could observe in terms of ordinary matter operating according to known gravitational laws. But they found they were not able to do that. For example, they found they could not explain the spiral structure of galaxies in that way. So to actually explain what they observed, scientists introduced a strange new substance that they call dark matter. <laughs> and this dark matter cannot be directly observed, but still it has gravitational effects that are observable. So it's really pretty a mystical idea, some invisible substance with gravitational pull. And they found that even that was not enough to explain everything they observed. So in more recent years, they've introduced an even stranger new thing that they call dark energy. And this dark energy has a force that operates the opposite of gravity. Gravity attracts. This dark energy pushes things outward. So today, Astrophysicists believe that the cosmos is composed of only 5% ordinary matter. 30% they believe is composed of this strange new substance they call dark matter. And 65% is composed of this even stranger new thing that they call dark energy. So the, the significant thing here is that in order to explain what they observed, scientists are introducing new substances into our picture of physical reality. And I'm proposing we need to introduce into our scientific picture of biolo biological reality new substances. Of course, ordinary matter is there. Everybody accepts that. We're composed of molecules of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, all those things. But beyond that, I think we need to introduce things that go beyond the chemical elements. And I'm not the only one who's saying this. This is Rodney Brooks, who's a scientist at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Artificial Life Lab. A few years ago, he published an interesting article in Nature 
uh, the world's leading scientific journal. And he said, there must be some extra sort of stuff in living systems outside our current scientific understanding. And the reason he said that is that the programs, the scientific programs of artificial life and artificial intelligence are failing. Uh, artificial life means trying to recreate the symptoms of life in machines like robots. And artificial intelligence means trying to reproduce the features of mind in computers. And uh, a few decades ago, scientists believed they could make incredible progress in these areas so that they'd be able to produce totally lifelike robots with computers in them that could just totally duplicate human mind and intelligence. They've been able to do that to some extent, but not to the extent that they once hoped would be possible. So Rodney Brooks was asking, why aren't we able to do this? If life really is just a combination of material elements, we should be able to make machines and computers do everything that human beings are capable of doing. But we're not able to do it. Why not? That's where he came to this conclusion. There might be some extra sort of stuff in physical systems, living systems, outside our current scientific understanding. And what might that extra sort of stuff be, uh, according to Brooks? Well, some ineffable entity, such as the soul or Ivan Vital, some vital force. So I actually agree with him. I agree with his analysis of the problem. The problem is, there might be some extra sort of stuff in living systems, and I believe he's on the right track, that there is some ineffable entity, such as the soul, some vital force. So, I consider one of these vital forces to be the mind. And I think there is some, and then beyond that, there is consciousness, which can exist apart from matter, apart from the body. And in terms of science, everybody already accepts that we're made of molecules. That's part of what a human being is. We're, we're made of molecules of iron and carbon and nitrogen and calcium and phosphorus and all of that. That's part of what we are. But beyond that, there is a subtle mind element with some very unusual, one might say, paranormal powers associated with the human organism. And there is some scientific evidence for this. Now, mind is something like air, in the sense that we can't see air, but if air moves over an element that we can't see, like water, we can observe its effects. We can see ripples forming on the surface of the water. So, mind, similarly, is invisible. We can't see it. But some scientists have observed the very unusual effects of mind on ordinary matter. <clears throat> and as I said, there is scientific evidence for this, but it's been subjected to that same process of knowledge filtration that I talked about this morning in terms of archaeological evidence, stones and bones. <clears throat> so, I'm now going to give a few examples of scientists who have investigated the powers of mind, showing that mind is an independent substance associated with the human organism. And one of the scientists who investigated this in the 19th century was Alfred Russell Wallace. Now, he was the co-founder of the theory of evolution by natural selection, along with Darwin. And Darwin had been sitting in his house in England, working for years and years, trying to come up with his theory. He hadn't published it. And suddenly he got a letter from Alfred Russell Wallace, a young scientist, who had completely come up with the whole theory of evolution by natural selection, independently from Darwin, and he was about to publish it. So Darwin was shocked. You know, I've been working on this theory for decades, and now this, this upstart is about to get all the fame and glory by publishing before I do. 
So they made a solution they would publish together. <clears throat> so for a long time, it was called the Darwin-Wallace theory of evolution. But then Wallace's name gradually got dropped out because he started getting into research into the paranormal. And Darwin was really upset with him. He said, by getting into this, you're going to kill our child, you know, the theory of evolution. So Darwin was aghast, you know, that Wallace was getting into these things. So Wallace was joined in his research by another prominent English scientist, Sir William Crookes. Unfortunate name for an honest man. <laughs> but um, he was, he became president of the Royal Society, which is England's topmost scientific organization. He was a physicist. So together, Wallace and Crookes were investigating mediums. Now, mediums are people with paranormal powers. One of the mediums they studied was a man named Daniel Dunglass Hume. <clears throat> and Hume had some interesting abilities. For example, he could take an accordion and hold it at the end opposite the keys. And just holding it like that, he could cause it to play very elaborate tunes. So Wallace and Crooks thought, well, uh, let's do some experiments with this man. Uh, first, of all, first of all, he might be using a trick accordion. So let's get a brand new accordion from a music shop, one that he's never seen and never touched. Now let's use that in our experiments. And then they thought, okay, now maybe somehow like a magician, he's able to distract us, he's somehow or other getting his other hand or foot down there and he's touching the keys. So they set up an experiment like this. <laughs> He had, they built a cage. So he would have to hold the accordion in the cage so he could, his other hand or foot couldn't get down there and touch the keys. So their experimental setup was like this. He had to keep one hand on top of the table. The other hand is holding the accordion in the cage, you know, by the top, opposite the keys. And under these conditions, he was still able to cause the accordion to play very elaborate tunes. <clears throat> and that, it, it doesn't stop there. Both Crooks, a president of the Royal Society, and Wallace, a co-founder of the theory of evolution, said that they would see him take his hand out of the cage, and the accordion would be floating in the cage playing very elaborate tunes. Now you're not going to read about this in any of your science textbooks today. <laughs> but this is part of what I would call the hidden history of physics. That these prominent scientists were investigating these things and reporting them in their reports. So <clears throat> another thing that both Wallace and Crookes observed were levitations by Hume. Now we all know that a magician can make the illusion of a levitation. Maybe you've seen on television, you know, tricks of the magicians exposed and those types of TV shows. And to do something like that <clears throat> requires an apparatus and assistance. But that wasn't what occurred here. What would happen to be this? You know, Hume was living in London. He had an apartment there. So the scientists would go to him unannounced, without any warning. And they would say, come with us this second, right now. Nobody else, just you. And they would take him to the house of an English scientist or some other prominent person. And they would not give him any opportunity. They wouldn't leave him for a second. He had no opportunity to to make any kind of apparatus or bring with him any kind of associates to help him. And then just standing in the middle of the room, just like you know, if we were out there and somebody just stood right in the middle of everybody and he would just rise up into the air. And this is noted by Wallace, Crooks, other prominent English scientists. You know, I write about these things in my book, Human Devolution. All the documentation is there. On one occasion, they had him on the third floor of a building, <clears throat> he floated into the air, 
he assumed a horizontal position, floated out a window, came around, floated in another window, <laughs> and assumed the vertical position, standing on the floor. Now, as I said, you're not going to read about this in any physics textbooks, but these are some of the things that prominent scientists have observed. And I take it as the influence of the mind element. Mind can overcome matter and material laws. I mean, some people uh, have, are aware that in many different ancient wisdom traditions, there are accounts of shamans and yogis who can do these things. But some people say, well, that's all mythology. That's just the imagination to the authors of these ancient books. Scientists have never observed these things. Not true. Some very prominent scientists have observed these things. <clears throat> Another example. Every physics student learns about the work of Pierre and Marie Curie. Uh, they lived early in the 20th century. They were husband and wife. They both got Nobel Prizes in physics. And every high school physics textbooks will tell you that, you know, that they got their Nobel Prizes in physics for discovering radium and doing a lot of the early research in that field. What you don't read in the textbooks is that they were heavily involved in psychical research. <laughs> they were part of a group of about 20 prominent European scientists who were conducting such research in Paris early in the 20th century. The group included five Nobel Prize winners, including the Curies. And this group did two years of experiments with the Italian medium Eusebia Palladino. And she had some unusual psychokinetic powers. Now these experiments did not take place in somebody's dark living room, which is the usual idea that's presented. These experiments took place in the Psychology Institute in Paris. And uh, for example, on one occasion, they had the medium in the lab sitting in a chair. Marie Curie was holding her hands. Other scientists were holding her feet to make sure she wasn't moving at all. And under those conditions, in broad daylight, in the laboratory, Pierre Curie, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, said a large table like one of these here was floating three feet off the ground in the presence of this woman. He was very carefully measuring how high it was floating, checking to see there's nothing, you know, no wires, nothing. <clears throat> and after two years of such results, the whole group of scientists signed a document saying these things are absolutely true. Pierre Curie wrote to his prominent physicist friend saying these things are absolutely true and we have to take them into account if we're going to have a complete picture of reality. And again, I take this as evidence for the existence of a subtle mind energy associated with the human organism that can act on ordinary matter in some very unusual ways. <clears throat> Now, research in this same area has gone on into more recent times. Uh, the scientists who are doing the more recent research are dealing more with micro effects of the mind element rather than the macro effects that the Curies and Wallace and people like that were dealing with early, in earlier times. But such research still is going on. This is Robert John, who was head of the engineering department at Princeton University. And he and his colleagues started doing some interesting experiments with random number generators. So a random number generator is a computer-like machine that will generate as an output a genuinely random series of zeros and ones. If you let the machine run by itself, it will generate 50% zeros, 50% ones, just as you would expect. But John and his colleagues asked students from the university to sit in front of these machines and simply will mentally 
that they produce more ones than zeros or more zeros than ones. And the experiments went on for over 10 years and they found that the students were actually able to do it. They were actually able to cause the random number generators to generate more ones than zeros or more zeros than ones, just according to their mental intention. And again, I take this as evidence for the existence of a subtle mind element associated with the human organism that can act on ordinary matter in ways that we cannot explain by our current laws of physics. <clears throat> Some interesting experiments of extrasensory perception have been performed at universities in Europe. They're called the Gottsfield Extrasensory Perception Experiments. And in these experiments, a person called a receiver is put into a state of mild sensory deprivation. They get white noise coming in through the earphones. Their vision is blocked off. And meanwhile, at another location, there's another person called a sender who looks at an image randomly selected by a computer from an image bank. And then the sender mentally sends, tries to mentally send that image to the receiver. After each trial, the receiver is shown four images, one of which is the actual target image. Now, if there's no paranormal effect and you run this experiment thousands of times, you would expect the receiver to pick the correct image 25% of the time, one time out of four. That's what you would expect if there was no paranormal effect, if it's just by chance that they picked the right image. But, the experimenters have found, after doing hundreds of thousands of these trials, that the receivers are able to pick the correct image at a rate greatly exceeding 25% of the time, which again means that the mind is able to access this kind of information in ways that we cannot explain by our current laws of physics. So there's more evidence of this type. But what it does, it establishes that we're not just a combination of molecules. There is a subtle mind element associated with the human organism that has some very unusual powers. And beyond that, there is evidence for a conscious self that can exist apart from matter, apart from the brain, apart from the body. There are times when a person should be completely unconscious, like when you're listening to a long, boring lecture like this. <laughs> Is everybody still conscious? Okay. So, for example, during a heart attack, the heart stops beating, blood stops flowing to the brain, medical instruments <clears throat> show that the brain waves stop. So, at a moment like that, a person should be completely unconscious, yet many people in this condition report separating from their bodies, and they look down and they see what the doctors and nurses treating them are trying to do. So, the American cardiologist, Michael Sabin, heard some of these reports from his patients, his heart attack patients, and he wondered, are these people telling the truth, or are they just making up stories? So he decided to do an investigation. And his methodology was this. He selected about 25 heart attack patients who had experienced these out-of-body experience, experiences, and he interviewed them very carefully. He asked them, tell me every single detail that you can recall, what you saw, what you heard the doctors doing and nurses doing. He carefully recorded all that information. Then he went to the doctors and nurses who had treated these patients and asked to see their detailed medical records. Because these days, doctors keep very detailed medical records, or at least they should. And you have to prevent medical malpractice suits and things like that. So 
the patients do not see these detailed medical records and each case of heart attack resuscitation is not the same. It's, it's different in each case. So he compared the reports given by the patients with the medical records kept by the doctors who treated them and he found they matched, which is an objective test that these people were not just making up stories, they were reporting actual physical facts that they observed. Now, Dr. Satan decided to do an additional test because some people might say, well, they've seen a lot of doctor movies, uh, maybe they've talked to other patients, maybe. So what he did is he took another group of heart attack patients who had not experienced these kinds of incidents, and he asked them, just on the basis of what you know and what you've heard, just imagine for me what you think the doctors and nurses were doing and saying you know, as they revived him. So they, he carefully recorded all that. And he found they all made major mistakes when he compared what they said to the records that had been kept by the physicians who had treated them. So here is medical evidence for a conscious self that can separate from the body, separate from the brain, and then re-enter the same body. That leads to another idea. The idea that if the conscious self can exist apart from the body, then when this body perishes, it could go to another body. This is the idea of reincarnation or transmigration of the conscious self. <clears throat> so there is some scientific evidence for that. It comes from psychiatric studies of past life memories. Dr. Ian Stevenson, a psychiatrist at the University of Virginia Medical School and his colleagues studied thousands of cases of past life memories reported by young children. He preferred dealing with young children because an older person could do some research on the web, get all the details of some past life, and come up with some convincing past life study. A child three or four years old isn't liable to do that, although I'm beginning to wonder. <laughs> <laughs> some of those little kids are getting pretty expert with their little iPads and things. But, uh, <clears throat> Uh, but in addition to recording all the details that these children, thousands of children, would report about past lives, he would verify these details by extensive research into extensive research. And in over 800 cases, Stevenson and his colleagues were able to verify the existence of the person the child claimed to have been in the past life. They weren't claiming to have been Cleopatra and Napoleon, famous people. They were claiming to be quite ordinary people that just happened to have died shortly before their own births. So there is a body of scientific evidence that supports this idea of transmigration of the conscious self from one body to another. Now, some people in the scientific world are still going to remain a little bit skeptical, you know, you know random number generators, past life memories, all, all very mystical. Uh, but I thought it was interesting that Carl Sagan, who was really a skeptic about this stuff, wrote in his last book, The Demon Haunted World, there are three claims at the ESP field which deserve serious study. One that by thought alone, humans can affect random number generators and computers. Two, that people under mild sense deprivation can receive <coughs> thoughts or images that are projected at them. And three, that young children sometimes report the details of a previous life. Now, I don't agree with Carl Sagan that those are the only three things which deserve serious investigation, but just those three things alone 
give enough evidence to support my idea that a human being is not just a machine made of molecules, but is a complex combination of matter, mind, and consciousness, with mind and consciousness having their own independent existence from matter. <clears throat> so if we want to talk about human origins, we have to go beyond the molecules. We have to think about all three of these things. Where did they all come from? How did they come together in the human form? And this leads to another interesting idea, that we exist in a multi-level cosmos with three primary levels. They can be subdivisions of these different levels, but just to give the basic idea, there's one level of the cosmos that is dominated by ordinary matter, the level down there at the bottom. That's where we find ourselves now. Beyond that, there is a level of the cosmos dominated by subtle mental energies. It's inhabited by beings adapted to the conditions there. People in different cultures have different names for these beings. They call them angels, astral beings, jinn, devas, gods, goddesses. Beyond that, there is the level of pure consciousness, which is inhabited by beings adapted to the conditions there. So, there's a multi-level cosmos that we are in. And different spiritual, ancient wisdom traditions have this idea of a multi-level cosmos. It was there in medieval Christianity where they believed there was a terrestrial level at the bottom, an angelic level, and then finally the pure spiritual level. The Egyptians had that idea, the Chinese, the Australian Aboriginals. It's a common feature of ancient wisdom traditions that we exist in a multi-level cosmos. Now, I got exposed to this idea when I was very young. You know, my father was an Air Force intelligence officer. That meant our family was moving to lots of different places in the world. This is me in my first grade class in Hawaii, where I was living at that time. Miss Kitigawa, the teacher there. Can you see me there in the, in the classroom? That's me. <laughs> Happy little fellow. <clears throat> so... Uh, when we were in Hawaii, when, I, when my family was in Hawaii, my parents took me and my brother and sister to the big island of Hawaii on a family vacation. And we went to the Kilauea volcano crater there. And this is a picture of my father, my brother, and me at Kilauea in 1956. Now, We've been talking a little bit, some of the speakers have mentioned sacred places. So this place is sacred to the Hawaiian people because it is the home of the fire goddess, Pele. <clears throat> and if you go around the volcano crater, you can find little pieces of volcanic Glass, they call Pele's tears. And then there is this fine spun volcanic glass. Looks like Pele's hair. So, <clears throat> uh, this is a picture of my mother and brother. They're, I was also there. We were looking for these Pele's tear and Pele's hair. And I found some, kept them. <clears throat> And then the Hawaiian guides took us down into the volcano. You can see there, there's the outer rim, and there's a path that goes down. And then in the center, there's the actual fire hole where Pele resides, actually. And this is a recent picture. I don't have a picture 
of the ceremony that we engaged in. But there's a ceremony where you offer fruits and flowers into the fire hall to Pele. And I did that under the direction of some Hawaiian kahunas. And after I did that, the kahunas gave me an amulet, a Pele amulet, and they said, whenever you go into the realm of volcanoes, Pele, the goddess Pele, will protect you. So then, some years later, I was in the United States Navy. I was stationed in Iceland. <laughs> I was at a weather station there. And during my free time, I would go on little expeditions in Iceland. Now, in Iceland, there's a big volcano called Hekla. During the Middle Ages, they called it the gateway to hell. And Jules Verne wrote a novel called Journey to the Center of the Earth, where scientists go down, you know, through the Hekla, Hekla volcano, down to the center of the Earth. So it's a very interesting place. When I was there in 1970, there was an eruption of Hekla, and there was a flow of lava coming out of the side of the mountain, flowing across this plain of this the black sand desert of volcanic ash. So a friend of mine and I in the Navy rented a Land Rover and we drove out to Hecla. <clears throat> and there aren't any roads going out there. You have to cross these glacial streams, go on these tracks across this black sand desert. And we came to Hecla, and this is <clears throat> the end of the lava flow. The lava flow was coming forward. On, on the forward edge of it, it becomes solidified. But inside, the liquid is still moving forward. You can see down at the bottom some of the red uh, area where the glowing molten lava is coming gradually forward, pushing, pushing forward. If you go back along the lava flow, it's like a river of lava flowing with some chunks uh, of solid lava floating. <clears throat> like ice and an ice flow. <coughs> so when I went back along the lava flow, I jumped on one of those solid pieces of lava and rode it along the lava flow, <laughs> thus inventing the sport of lava surfing, <laughs> which I think I'm the sole practitioner. <laughs> Don't try that at home, kids. <laughs> so I jumped off, and then, you know, we kind of packed a picnic lunch. We had, uh, you know, we had a pot, you know, some of these, you know, like these freeze-dried soup, you know, you open up the packet, and you pour it in some water. So we got some water, put the soup in it, cooked it on the lava. <coughs> and then we, were, we kind of went on a hill overlooking the lava flow at the base of the volcano, and we were having our lunch. And then the hill just started shaking and like just dropped about a foot under us and then we just started running. You know, we just left the pot, left the soup, and we just ran back to the Land Rover, which was parked about a mile away. We turned around and looked. <clears throat> now this is, this is not a picture that I took, but the hill that we were standing on exploded and just fountains of lava started shooting up and a column of ash just shot about 20,000 feet into the air. And my friend looked at me and said, we are so lucky we could have been killed. And I said, maybe it wasn't luck because I still had my Pele amulet. <laughs> and I really believe that Pele saved me in that circumstance because the Kahunas had told me if you, whenever you go into the realm of volcanoes, Pele will protect you. So even from a young age, I had an intuitive sense that I exist in a multi-level cosmos. There are higher intelligences in this cosmos who are watching over us. 
So I had that intuitive sense and some practical experience that made sense to me that this is, in fact, the case. But uh, some people wonder, well, what kind of scientific evidence is there for this idea that we live in a multi-level cosmos inhabited by all kinds of intelligent beings? Uh, you know, other than reports from ancient wisdom traditions and questionable experiences by people like you. Um, <laughs> what kind of you know, scientific evidence for it, is there for this? And I've documented some of the categories of evidence that support this idea in my book, Human Devolution. And here are six. One type of evidence, one category of evidence is communication from spirits of departed humans received by humans existing on this level of the cosmos. A second category of evidence is cases of possession of the bodies of living humans on this level by spirits of departed humans that are now existing on some other level of the cosmos. A third category, apparition of the spirits of departed humans that become visible to those of us who are on this level. Four, possession of bodies <clears throat> of humans on this level by not spirits of departed humans, but by spirits of superhuman types of beings. Then, a fifth category of evidence, apparition of superhuman beings to humans on this level of reality. And then six, the modern UFO alien abduction types of events. <clears throat> so I'm just going to give one example from each of these categories of evidence. I'm going to start out with communications from spirits of departed humans. This is Sir Oliver Lodge, who was a prominent British physicist. <clears throat> He had a son, Raymond, who was killed during the First World War. And Lodge and his wife were very devastated by the loss of their son. <clears throat> so Lodge decided he wanted to see if he could establish some communication with the spirit of his departed son. So he approached a medium named Gladys Leonard in England. <clears throat> and he went to her in disguise. He was a prominent scientist, but he used another name. He went in disguise. He didn't want her to know who he really was. <clears throat> and through this medium, he was able to establish communication with the spirit of his departed son. And things were revealed in these communications that would only have been known to Raymond Lodge. Little details about the family history, special little nicknames that the family members had for each other. All of these kinds of intimate details that would only have been known to Raymond, that weren't part of any public record that this woman could have accessed. And Lodge wrote a whole book about it. And I think it's a very important book because he addresses in this book all, all the kinds of skeptical objections that his scientific colleagues might have come up with. <clears throat> so, now uh, I'll give an example of some scientific evidence for a case of spirit possession by the spirit of a departed human. This is the psychologist William James, who was known as the father of modern psychology. In his textbook, Principles of Psychology, he mentions a genuine, what he regarded as a genuine case of spirit possession. <clears throat> The case is called the Watsaka Wonder. So Watsaka is a small town in Illinois. 
Now, in a little bit of synchronicity, it also happens to be the name of the street that I live on in Los Angeles, Watsika Avenue. <clears throat> so maybe there's some kind of connection here, but... <clears throat> so in the town of Watsika lived the Venom family. And they had a daughter named Lorancy. And Lorancy Venom lived a quite ordinary life until she was a teenager, and then she began to go into trance states. And in these trance states, she encountered spirits of departed humans. One of them was that of a girl named Mary Roth. So the spirit of Mary Roth told Lorenzi, I want to visit my parents on Earth. I want to visit my Earth family, and I would like to use your body to do it. <clears throat> so, Lorenzi agreed. So after that happened, she began to feel like a stranger in her own house, the Venom house. She started speaking about this Roth family, and her parents were just... They didn't know what to do. Finally, they decided, well, let, me, let us track down this Roth family. So they did that. And they brought the Roth family to the Venom house. And as they were coming up to the house, Lorenzi looked out. She immediately recognized them. That's my mother. That's my father. That's my sister. <clears throat> so both families agreed Lorenzi should go and live with the Roths. And she did that for several weeks. And she behaved perfectly as their daughter, displaying all kinds of knowledge of the family's history. And that went on for several weeks until she again began going into the trance states. And then the spirit of Mary Roth said, okay, I visited my family. I'm going to go back to where I was. And when that happened, she began to feel like a stranger in the Roth house. She became very homesick for her own family, so that both families agreed she should go back to the Venom family, where you know, she just lived out a normal life after that. Now, so this is a, what I find interesting about this case, it was reported in his textbook, Principles of Psychology, by the founder of modern psychology, William James, as a genuine case, in his opinion, of spirit possession. Now I'll go on to the next category, apparitions of departed humans. This is Charles Tweedale, who's a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society in England early in the 20th century. He recalled that as a boy, once he was sleeping in his room, in the family's house, and he woke up in the middle of the night. The moon was shining in his window, and at the foot of his bed, he saw the form of an elderly woman just standing there. So in the morning, Charles got up, went down to breakfast, sat at the breakfast table with his mother and father, and said, Mommy, Last night I saw something very interesting. I woke up and I saw standing at the foot of my bed the form of this elderly woman wearing a bonnet. And, and at that moment, his father just suddenly got up from the table, walked out, slammed the door behind him. And little Charlie said, Mommy, why did Daddy leave like that? And his mother told him, well, last night in our room, your father saw the form of his mother standing at the foot of the bed. <clears throat> and then later in the day, they got a telegram saying that this woman had died the previous night. And later in his life, Charles Tweedale, because he's a professional astronomer, and he recalled the position of the moon as it was shining in the window of his bedroom. He could calculate exactly what time the apparition appeared. And it turned out to be 
just shortly after the reported time of death of this woman. So here we have a report of an apparition of the spirit of a departing human from a prominent astronomer in England. So, <laughs> cases of possession by superhuman beings, many, I mean, you're all familiar with this novel and film, The Exorcist. What many people don't understand is that was based on an actual exorcism that was carried out on a boy by a Catholic priest in the Washington, D.C., Baltimore area. And the details in the film and the novel are based on the actual case history. And if you're familiar with it, you can see this is not a case of the possession you know, by the spirit of some departed girl who just wanted to see her mother and father again. This was a possession by a superhuman being with superhuman powers. <clears throat> And some of these possessions can be possessions of more angelic beings and some of them by more demoniac beings. So this was clearly a case of the possession of the body of a human on this level by a spirit, a superhuman spirit, in this case of a demoniac nature. Sometimes it can be of a more angelic nature. Then there are apparitions of superhuman types of beings that become visible to humans on this level of reality. There are many well-documented cases, of, in Europe especially, of Marian apparitions. Apparitions of the Virgin Mary. Uh, there's prominent cases that occurred in you know, Belgium and Italy and Portugal and Fatima. I visited that site myself. And then another category of evidence comes from the modern UFO alien abduction types of events. And among the researchers who investigate this type of evidence are two major groups. One we could call the nuts and bolts group. And they tend to look at UFOs and aliens. They look at UFOs as just machines made of matter, iron and steel and all that, that just come from some other part of the universe. And they look at aliens as just flesh and blood types of human-like beings from other parts of the cosmos, just machines made of molecules, but from some other part of the universe. Uh, that's one group. But then there's another group who see paranormal elements to all of this. They don't look at the UFOs as just machines made of matter coming from some other part of the cosmos. They think they're interdimensional craft that are made of subtle energies. I, I myself am in this group and I try to get some of these points across in the television series that aired on the History Channel over the past year or two, Ancient Aliens. And as far as the aliens themselves go, this, this group of researchers sees paranormal elements, like people report communicating telepathically with them, being floated through walls up to their craft, and things like that. So one of the scientists in that group was Dr. John Mack, who was the head of the psychiatry department at Harvard University Medical School. And you know, he had heard about these abduction reports. He investigated them, and he concluded they were real. And then he even went beyond that and concluded there was a paranormal element to them. And he wrote in his book, Passport to the Cosmos, it appears ever more likely that we exist in a multi-dimensional cosmos. The cosmos appears to be filled with beings, creatures, spirits, intelligences, gods. And I agree with him. 
And actually, we once met at a conference that was held in Glastonbury, a crop circle concert uh, conference. Um, I was a speaker there, he was a speaker there. He came up to me after my talk and he said he liked it very much and he wanted to stay in touch with me. And I was familiar with his work because after he started publishing things like this, his colleagues at Harvard University were outraged. And they convened an academic court to try to get him removed from his position. He was a tenured professor at Harvard. Tenure means you're supposed to be in a position where you can't be fired. <clears throat> Universities uh, grant tenure to professors to try to give them some academic freedom. But apparently he had gone one step too far. So his colleagues convened an academic court to get his tenure removed so that he could be fired. Now he successfully defended himself, so I was aware of that. So I was very happy to meet John Mack in Glastonbury, England, and we were going to stay in touch with each other. But shortly after that, he died under mysterious circumstances in an automobile accident in England. It's a great loss to uh, the researchers who are pursuing these kinds of things. But as far as existing in a multi-dimensional, multi-level cosmos, inhabited by all types of beings, that is the main point. I accept that. <clears throat> so there are different features of existing in a multi-level cosmos. One feature is travel between the different levels. Uh, and I'll just give an example for each of these features. Now, there's black elves, American Indian shaman. <clears throat> he reported being taken by his spirit guides through different levels of the cosmos. So this is a, a feature of a lot of different ancient wisdom traditions being, you know, people reporting being taken through different levels of the cosmos, not to, just to another planet, but to a whole different level of reality. And travel can sometimes be done with machines, which may involve subtle energies. This is from a 14th century wall painting in Kosovo, which is in the former Yugoslavia in Europe. <clears throat> It's a very interesting painting. It, you know, it shows what appears to be a human being in some type of machine going through the stars and piloting it. Now, in the ancient Sanskrit writings of India, there's mention of vimanas, interdimensional flying machines made of subtle energies, sometimes of grosser energies. But a lot of the ancient wisdom traditions have these things. And it's also possible you know, to travel without the aid of any kind of machine. Yogis and mystics are able to do that. Another feature of existence in a multi-level cosmos is information transmission between the different levels. Uh, a lot of the different ancient wisdom traditions have ideas like that. Information coming from higher levels down to our level. In ancient Babylonia, we have this sculpture of a being called the sun god, Shamash, instructing King Hammurabi about laws. And most governments in big countries at one time or another have had programs searching for communications from extraterrestrial intelligences. Russia has had such a program, France, America once had some government support for it. And generally they're kind of looking for electromagnetic signals, but there may be other ways in which uh, higher intelligences are trying to communicate with humans on Earth. <clears throat> now another feature of this multi-level cosmos is that the beings at the higher levels are able to influence the biological forms of those on 
the lower levels. And there's some evidence for this in terms of miraculous healings. There's a place called Lourdes in France uh, where one of these Marian apparitions took place. Uh, the story is pretty well known. There were these village girls. They went outside the village. They saw this cave, the form of a glowing woman, and uh, they called the Virgin Mary. Uh, you know, a lot of different wis wisdom traditions have these uh, concepts of healing goddesses. <clears throat> so, you know, perhaps because this was Catholic Europe, they interpreted it as the Virgin Mary. What it actually was, I can't say except to say that this idea of healing goddesses is very widespread. So people would later come to that cave where there was a small spring you know, giving some water, and they would take bath in that water and experience uh, miraculous cures. And they wouldn't attribute the cure to the water itself. They attribute the cure to the higher being who's associated with that place. Like there was a case of a French workman who had a severe case of varicose veins. And then immediately after uh, taking bath at Lourdes, he was really cured. And what I like about Lourdes is that for over 100 years, they've had a medical institute there where they carefully document these cures. If a person comes with some incurable condition or disease, it's documented medically. If they experience a cure, it's also documented medically. And I'm just reflecting on something that James said yesterday, that in this modern age, part of what uh, we're meant to do is offer some scientific evidence for a lot of these features in order to expand the circle of people who accept these things. I know a lot of you already accept these things. You don't need any scientific evidence for that. But if we're to expand the circle of people who accept these things, expand the influence of these things into different areas of society, in a society that's more or less dominated by science, it's helpful to have some scientific evidence, as James was saying yesterday. So uh, let me wrap this up. <clears throat> what I believe what I'm convinced of is that we originally exist as beings of pure consciousness. That is what we really are. And consciousness always exists. It doesn't ever come into being. It never goes out of being. So originally, we are beings of pure consciousness that exist at the topmost level of the cosmos existing in harmony with all other conscious beings, existing in harmony with the source of all conscious beings. And the ruling principle of that level of the cosmos is love. If a conscious self becomes egotistical, selfish, it can no longer exist in that harmony. It must go to some other energetic level where it can act in competition with each other to try to dominate, control, and exploit the lower energies of mind and matter. So some of the conscious selves, they come down to the level of the mental energies, and they exist there as astral beings, or gods, or goddesses, or gene, or whatever. <clears throat> and then some conscious selves they come down even further to the level of gross matter, which is where we find ourselves now. And they receive a covering made of gross matter. That's what these bodies are. They're vehicles for conscious selves that allow us to function on this level of reality. <clears throat> and for example, as human beings, we're normally meant to live on the land. We walk around on the land. We function just fine here. If we want to exist in an alien element, like under the water, then we need a vehicle that will allow us to function in that alien element, like a submarine or a diving suit. <clears throat> so that's what these bodies that we have are. They're vehicles for conscious selves that allow us to function on this level of reality. So 
this process by which a conscious self descends into these energies of mind and matter and becomes covered by them is what I call devolution. In other words, as conscious beings, we don't evolve up from matter, as most scientists now believe. Rather, we devolve or come down from this level of pure consciousness. And we're meant to return to that level of pure consciousness. Uh, and the ancient Greeks, philosophers like Plato, had this idea that on the level of pure consciousness, there are forms that exist. And then they get reflected down into the world of matter. So we are reflections from that higher realm of pure consciousness. Now where our existence is reflected into this realm of ordinary matter. And according to Plato, there was a, an entity called the Demiurge, who was responsible for translating the higher forms into the lower expressions of these forms. So we begin with a form of pure consciousness. It can become covered by the lower energies of mind and matter, but it's a process that can be reversed and consciousness can be restored to its original pure state. And that is the actual purpose of human life from which many people have become distracted because of too much materialism. So this vehicle that we have, it can be used for two purposes. It can be used to become more and more deeply entangled in trying to dominate, control, and exploit matter in competition with others for survival. That's why those who support that agenda want to keep the Darwinian theory of evolution intact in the education system to keep people focused on competing with each other for survival, for control of matter, to produce and consume more and more material things which enrich certain people and result in the formation of certain political and economic and cultural, cultural patterns. But the other purpose for that human vehicle is to return to the state of pure consciousness, not to compete with others, but to say, hey, we're all coming from the same place. We're all related to each other. We have some higher purpose together, which we're meant to achieve. So there are different systems for transforming consciousness that are there in many of the world's great spiritual traditions. And I'm not here to recommend any particular one of them, just to say, find the system of consciousness transformation that works for you and apply it in your life. And as I said, I mean, I've found a lot of inspiration in the spiritual tradition of India, but I don't claim to have a monopoly on truth. I think this sort of thing can be found in many different places, and each individual has to decide what place is best for them. And what I'm talking about here is not the traditional forms that most religions now take in the world. I'm talking about techniques of consciousness transformation. Just like a, a geologist can tell us how to extract the element gold from its ore where it's mixed with other less valuable elements. That once you've extracted the gold, you can form it into coins and then you can stamp the coins with the symbols of different nations. But if it's really gold, it doesn't matter what symbol that you've stamped on it. Because gold has its own value, apart from any symbol that's stamped on it. So similarly, if by some technique of consciousness transformation, we can come to the level of understanding, I am a being of pure consciousness, all others are beings of pure consciousness, we're all related, no need to compete and fight with each other, if we can achieve that level of awareness, it doesn't matter what you call it. You could call it 
Hinduism or Buddhism or Taoism or Native American wisdom or whatever, if you actually come to that level of consciousness and awareness, it doesn't matter what you call the system that got you there. So I'm going to end with just talking about the implications for education policy. I think that in our public school systems, we need to offer alternatives to the current Darwinian theory of evolution, which now has a government enforced monopoly in the education system. I think that's not really a good thing for a country that calls itself democratic. Uh, you know, that the government gives one group of scientists a monopoly in the education system. I think the alternative should also be there. I would say, well, let's admit that today most of the scientists accept the Darwinian theory of evolution. So give them the majority of the textbook pages. But in some part of the textbooks, some part of the classroom time, it should be mentioned there are researchers, there are scientists who don't accept that theory. And here's what their ideas are. And then let the students make up their own minds about what they want to believe. I think that would be the fairest thing in a country that regards itself as democratic and free. Just like there is separation between church and state, there should be separation between science and state. So, thank you very much.